Hi, everybody. So thank you for all being here. Um, I'm going to, before the webinar, I'm also going to explain really quick that this is an interactive webinar in which you are, uh, together with Eve, you are in the spotlight. So you are um, able to ask Eve any, anything, basically, but uh, definitely stuff that is uh, related to the webinar's topic, which is quality systems and uh, uh, data integrity and computer system validation. That's uh, what Eve is uh, here for today with us. Uh, he's the expert. I'm just going to moderate this webinar and, uh, and uh, make sure that all the questions get answered. Um, so the way it works, you can just post it in the chat, but there is also a separate button within Zoom, uh, which is called Q&A. Maybe that's easier. You can always post your questions in the chat. I will make sure to look at the chat too, but there is also a Q&A uh, section where you can post your questions and then I can track easily the ones that we've answered already and the ones that are still open. Um, if there are any questions that remain unanswered because we have to uh, constrain ourselves to one hour of webinar, don't worry about it. We will answer your questions over email in case these are not, uh, we, they cannot make it into the webinar. So don't worry about that. With that, um, two minutes over 11, I would like to just start uh, and I'll do that by introducing myself really quick. I'm Philip Heitbrink. I'm the CEO and co-founder of SciLife. And with me, we have Eve Dana from QBD. Eve, if you would like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Philip. Okay, two words about uh, Quality by Design. Quality by Design is uh, a company in the life science area. Uh, we are partnering with all kinds of companies throughout the entire product life cycle. We have services uh, related to clinical solutions, regulatory affairs, validation and qualification, quality assurance, quality control, project management, and training in the related domains. Uh, about myself, uh, I have about 30 years of experience in quality management systems. Uh, it started when I just uh, uh, arrived in the professional world. Uh, at that time, ISO 9001 was quite a popular topic and I assisted the company I was working for at the time to implement it, which is still relevant. Although in the life sciences, life sciences uh, ISO 9001 in itself might not be sufficient. Uh, about 10 years later, uh, around the year 2000, uh, some people say by accident, I rolled into the world of computerized system validation. Um, I started working for uh, Capgemini uh, and for them, I worked for several customers uh, in uh, computerized system validation. All kinds of systems. Uh, enterprise resource planning, warehouse management, uh, learning management, uh, quality systems, uh, laboratory systems, and so on. I also have a bit of experience in production systems, although not as fast. Seven years ago, uh, I changed from uh, Capgemini to QBD, uh, which I introduced a few minutes ago. Um, at that time, also data integrity became uh, a popular topic eh, as there was some regulatory uh, focus on it. Um, so in that domain, uh, I have assisted companies in uh, starting up a data integrity program and doing the actual uh, often related to CSV eh, because CSV is only a small part of uh, uh, data integrity. Data integrity is really company-wide. It's about awareness. It's about uh, how you live in your company with, uh, uh, with data integrity all the time at the back of your mind. So that's in short uh, who I am and Thank you, uh, looking forward to all the questions. Absolutely. So yeah, um, this gives everybody a, an idea of the types of questions that you can ask Eve, right? So uh, just to, to kick it off, I would like to start with one of the questions that um, that, that I hear sometimes from, from our customers at SciLife, uh, and where I think um, sometimes um, experts uh, are, are not entirely clear. So I was just wondering what your uh, view on this was. It's about overlapping regulation. So 
you you have this need to to comply with GDPR now in Europe, um, where the the person is entitled to get himself completely removed or herself completely removed from the database. So imagine that you have a, a pharma company or a medical device company that uh, has an employee. Uh, the employee leaves. And the employee, according to GDPR, wants to be completely removed. Of course, there is data in that quality management system that was signed off officially by that person. So how can you remove electronic signatures or other information or actions that were performed by that employee? Or uh, maybe in uh, clinical trials, for example, in which patients um, <clears throat> should be able to remove themselves completely out of the pharma uh, um, or pharmaceutical uh, company's database. However, there is this contradiction of the pharma regulation that says, no, no, you have to uh, have all your clinical trial data available uh, for inspection. So what's your view on, on this and how, how can this be solved? Yes, uh, two examples you provided. Let's tackle them one by one. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, if you're an employee at uh, a company, uh, you are performing tasks for your employer. And normally you will have signed a contract before you start working there. And then we have to look at the types of data, uh, privacy data that we talk about. Now, all the actions that you do in your role uh, in the company are not subject to GDPR. So if I signed, uh, let's say a validation plan today, uh, when I leave the company, I cannot ask to be removed from that validation plan. What will you find there? My name, a date and a signature. That's not GDPR data. Um, however, of course, everything that is related to your personal data, um, for example, uh, your date of birth, uh, your uh, um, social number. security, your credit card number, uh, those types of data, uh, everyone is allowed to remove. Yes. So. It's a bit double, uh, mm -hmm. but there is some, often a misconception about what I do uh, for the company itself. It's not GDPR. It does not have to be removed. It's legally uh, not, not allowed. Well, not allowed if, if you cannot ask that from your employer. Okay. Secondly, there is the clinical trials area where you have clinical data. Uh, that's, of course, a quite a bit more complex uh, uh, issue. Uh, there are also uh, quite some experts in that domain because it often can be a bit gray area. But mm. if you take part in a clinical trial, you will start with signing a consent. And in that document, there will be uh, quite in detail stipulated what the GDPR uh, aspects are and which you sign for. Uh, you should never forget if you're part of a clinical trial, you might get administered experimental drugs that might, uh, yes, might provide some side effects, adverse uh, uh, side effects longer term. And it's in your own interest that they keep at least your name uh, and the fact that you have been administered a certain experimental drug. Um, in, in, in this part, I would say that the, uh, the legislation around clinical trials prevails uh, on, on the G GDPR, although all non-essential essential data uh, can be asked to be removed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the conclusion is really the, the, the name of the person uh, will stay in the database in both examples. However, all the other GDPR related uh, information of that person can uh, should then uh, be removed if the person asks to do so. Well, right? it really depends upon uh, the consent form that has been signed as usually yeah. there is a GDPR section there and that will that should uh, uh, cover uh, what we just talked about. Yeah, and there is also this this um, possibility of anonymization of the data, right? In which yes. uh, the only uh, the pharma company knows wh who the person really is, but if that mm -hmm. data is used by uh, employees within the pharmaceutical company or by mm -hmm. partners, it can be anonymized to ensure also a greater privacy, right? Precisely, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you for that. That was uh, one of the questions I wanted to start with. I know it's a, a, yeah, a, a interesting topic for a lot of people out there. So thank you for your view on that. I would like to continue with some uh, questions that were already 
um, posted uh, by the uh, attendees when they registered for the webinar. So uh, we will uh, start with these. And then, um, as you know, uh, don't forget to keep posting questions right in the in the area um, uh, for in Zoom or in the chat. I prefer that you do that in the Q&A section in Zoom. As we go through this webinar, just keep posting questions there so that we can then select and um, discuss them uh, here with Eve in the webinar. All right, so the pre-posted questions, one comes from Damiano. Uh, the question is, major risks with a cloud-based system versus an in-house built solution. So what are the major risks? Um, uh, if you have to select between a cloud-based solution or an in-house built solution, uh, and there is then uh, a follow-up question. Well, let's start with this question first, and yes. then I'll ask the follow-up question, Eve. Yes. All right. The move to cloud systems, which has been going on for quite a while, because I remember when uh, I was working for one of the big companies, one of the first systems really going to the cloud was uh, electronic data capture in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are always risks, whether you have it on site, whether you have it uh, at a supplier, the risks are there all the time. But indeed, they may be uh, different. Um, now, if you go to a, a software as a service provider, there are two types. Well, there are many types, but from our perspective now, there are two types. There are those that are specifically directing their entire program or part of their product portfolio to pharma, and you have those who do not. Um, with the first one, it will be, of course, a bit easier because they know how to work. They know how life sciences uh, require uh, specific uh, compliance uh, uh, tasks to be fulfilled, uh, to follow certain regulations and so on. So that will make it easier. And the major risks, for example, um, where are my data located? Uh, how can you guarantee uh, uh, continuity so that you don't lose anything when while you are in progress of uh, working with data? Uh, these topics will generally be uh, tackled in advance. If you work with uh, the other type, which are also very valuable, uh, let's not have any doubt about that. Sometimes you need something new in your area and you will have to step out and go to uh, a partner that is not specifically uh, into life sciences. Then it will be key to uh, when you draw the contract, when you start creating the service level agreement to make sure that all the required uh, uh, required aspects of working together will be covered in both the contract and the service level agreement. Um, that's the shift from having your applications on site, where of course you need to have an IT infrastructure department or service that will take care of all your uh, security aspects uh, or going to a cloud provider. Usually today, when we do a validation effort where a cloud provider or software as a service is in, involved, uh, we do start with that uh, vendor uh, selection and uh, vendor assessment. Okay. Yeah, I would also like to add to that, that from a regulatory and from a risk perspective, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's a very good answer, I think. The thing that I would like to add is from a software development perspective that you shouldn't forget the effort that it requires a, a company to build his or her own tools, right? So um, the, the, the question would be, what is the core business of the company? Is, is it really, uh, yeah, building your own software tools or probably it's not. So um, finding the right partner for that might be um, uh, less risky than trying to do that in-house. Uh, the reason being that even if you're a medical device company with a with a very decent or, or great software development team to to develop the, the software part of your medical device, you, you probably don't want to move away your team from developing your product and do this side project of building whatever internal tool being a quality management system or, or any any tool that the company might need, you probably should have them focused on 
the product that they are building. Also, IT, I, the, there are often IT people that can uh, develop and, and, and program solutions, but IT is typically a department that needs to make sure that everything keeps running, not to build stuff. If, if they do, it, what can happen is that if somebody builds something within the company and that person leaves, um, you you lose the know-how of uh, what was built. It's it's tricky because you're typically not a software company, so it's built ad hoc by some persons, and then it's somehow not continued. Building a, a tool, I mean, business business needs change. The tool needs to be built according to some user requirements, but then it, it goes into a whole life cycle. It needs it needs upgrades. It needs to be revalidated. It needs to, uh, yeah, it, it's a whole effort to to keep something up to date as software. So that is definitely something that you should uh, add to your assessment if building in-house is the right choice for your company. So besides the risks from a regulatory uh, uh, perspective. All right, um, then there is a follow-up question from Damiano. Um, are there any CSV tests necessary to repeat once in production? Um, I'm not, in, yeah, I, I guess Damiano means for the cloud-based system, but yeah. Yes. Uh, but you can ask the question for in-house build systems as well. Yeah, and, it's the same thing. The answer thing. will yeah. not differ, I think. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we talk about CSV tests, there are several layers of tests. Uh, if you look at the traditional uh, uh, terminology, we speak about an installation qualification. There used to be operational qualification, which means actually the technical testing. And uh, in the past, because I don't like the term performance qualification, uh, these days we tend to use much more user acceptance testing. Uh, these are three types of testing. Um, the first one, installation qualification, is quite important. You will usually uh, at least execute it twice. You will execute it before you start testing in the validation environment. And if everything ends up successfully, you will perform the same installation qualification in your production environment. As such, it will prove that what you have tested in the validation environment, all the settings, uh, the technical setup will be reproduced in the production environment, meaning that the proof that you have coming from your tests is valid. Uh, secondly, you have the technical testing. I would never do any technical testing in, in, in the production environment. Um, user acceptance testing, often there is some, well, debate about it. Should I repeat that in production? If you ask me, I say no. Uh, what do you need to do in your production environment, whether it's uh, locally or cloud-based? You need to repeat your IQ. And part of the IQ will be to check that all the settings are correct and that if you have migrated data or if, if you have uploaded initial data to start your application with, to verify that that is there. What I would not do is to uh, do some repeat of user acceptance testing. Why? Because you will be creating dummy data in your uh, production environment. And they Absolutely, will, yeah. Yes, and they will either stay there or you will have to remove them. Uh, it will create risks and it's something that I rather see uh, to be avoided. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that. Thanks, Damiano, for the question. Then we have a, a, a question from Annika um, who asks, I would like to learn more about how SciLife performs CSV. Um, yeah, I, I can I can explain that uh, really quick. So what we do is a full GAM5 validation from the validation plan until the validation summary report and everything in between. So we write the URSs, uh, the, the functional specs, design specs, the OQ, OQs, the IQs, the, the, the PQs, and we execute everything as if it were a custom built app application for ourselves. That whole validation documentation package is then offered to our customers who can then use it as the basis to do the last validation steps on their end. So we really try to um, yeah, uh, take away much of the effort and the cost of uh, all our customers, uh, as opposed to having each customer validated on their own, because there would be a lot of 
duplicate effort uh, because they are all using the same application in the cloud, obviously. So it's much more efficient if we do that initial validation on our end, offer you the full validation documentation package, and you can then do the last steps on your end, and we can provide support uh, if, if you're struggling with the what these last steps should be, obviously. Uh, to add a little bit more to that, the whole SciLife platform is obviously modular. Uh, we have different modules that solve specific solutions within the platform. Uh, very uh, strict quality stand, oh yeah, uh, classic quality management, but also other uh, modules. And every module has its own version and is validated separately. So it's really like a like if uh, different applications are integrating with each other, but then within uh, under the same roof. Why? Because not everybody uses the same module. So you can really just select the modules that are interesting for your company. So some customers have three or four modules, others use six or seven. So if you are not using one of the modules that is being upgraded, it, if we would have one version for the whole uh, SciLife uh, software suite, you would have to do validation steps, which do not make sense for your company. That's why we have uh, developed the whole system very vertically into different modules. Every module has its own version and every module is uh, validated separately. And then uh, you only uh, have to do additional validation steps whenever we do an upgrade of that specific module. So um, <clears throat> this is how we try to keep it very, very efficient for customers and how we can keep building out the whole uh, SciLife platform um, as we as we go. So that's, um, uh, yeah, you want to add to that something? Yes, I want to add uh, one thing, and that's a, a big misconception that I have encountered on many occasions. And, and uh, some companies want to buy software, and then you have vendors, not SciLife, who say, we will sell you a validated application. Uh, if, if I hear a vendor saying that, I, I know it's very, it becomes very tricky because a vendor cannot sell you a validated application. Uh, it's it's uh, a contradictio in terminus, meaning that if you're the end user of a system, you will always need to validate the system for your own intended use. And as Philip said, you have many modules within SciLife. If you just take three uh, and on top of that, you will put the settings in SciLife differently than another company that means that the vendor cannot supply you with a validated system it would only be possible if you have uh, for the people who know gam5 if you would download an application and you use it as it is presented to you then maybe you could say it but even then you still need to train your people you still need to write the procedures to use it so actually you can never buy a completely validated system mm. there will always be some effort on your side but of course if your vendor, like SciLife says, we have a pre-validated package, you can leverage a lot of information, which will save you a lot of time and money. Yeah, thanks for that. If um, we have a question from uh, Pia, uh, when data and configuration changes are transferred from test to validation to production environments, is this process validated? Okay. So I, I guess this is a question, again, SciLife specific. Um, we indeed provide our customers with three environments, a test environment, a validation environment, and a production environment. The test environment is meant for really testing uh, the, the features. Uh, you can create uh, as many users as you want. You can create as many uh, items uh, and just test workflows and all that. The validation uh, environment is meant to um, properly uh, do the last validation steps in a separate environment, just like Eve explained at the beginning, to not do that in production and pollute your production environment with, with dummy data. You definitely want to avoid that. So validation and production are typically um, uh, identical in terms of versions. So you do your best last validation steps in, uh, in the validation environment. Then you go to production environment and there you do the data import if required for specific modules like document control or, or trainings or, or whatnot. Uh, and you configure the system directly in production. What we always advise it, we we had some in the past. We had some uh, misunderstandings that the the customer would uh, create everything correctly in the validation environment, uh, do a lot of effort there, uh, um, 
pre-configure everything that they needed, uh, upload data there. And then they said, okay, we're, we're ready to go to production. And there, yeah, um, during the onboarding, something went wrong. Uh, so we fixed that and we tried to explain that very clearly during the onboarding. But the, the, what we always try to avoid is that we do a, a, a transfer of your data from validation to production. So we always advise to use the validation environment only to do the last validation steps. And then the, the data is really uploaded or configured in production directly. Uh, there, is, there is normally no transfer of data from validation to production. Therefore, we do not need to, uh, to document or to validate this process because we advise not to do it like this. What we do document, obviously, um, we, we offer the possibility to import all your quality uh, QMS data from any a legacy system or, or uh, if you have it in Word documents and Excel to actually convert that and upload that into our production environment. And there we, of course, do that per customer. So we need to automate that process. It can be thousands of documents or, or data um, entries. So there we obviously uh, document the process of importing that data into production, absolutely. So this is how, how it works. So hopefully I clarified the, this misconception of transferring data between environments. We do um, not advise to do that like that. Yes, if you maybe, want to add something to that? Yes, uh, sometimes there is also discussion about the, really the mechanism in itself to mm -hmm. transfer settings. Eh? For example, if you have uh, an ERP system like SAP, um, you also have different environments. You have all the settings, uh, how transactions are being uh, developed and so on. Uh, now, they have like a kind of transport mechanism to move a baseline from one environment to the other. Uh, well, usually this is a standard part of the application. Um, and as such, as you will do your IQ in both environments, this will guarantee uh, to great length that what you have in tested in your validation environment will become uh, also present in the production environment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that answers this question. Um, we have live questions that have come in, um, which I would, would want to tackle. We have here uh, an explanation from, An, from Annika. Um, I'll, I'll try to read the explanation. I, I'll try to avoid yeah, saying names and stuff. This webinar is being recorded and it will be published at some point. So just to avoid any names, I'll try to explain what Anneke is portraying here as the as the as a question or as a problem so her company has a, a website uh, on this website our customers so these are IVD and MD companies so medical device companies they upload IFUs um, so yeah the, the, the labels so it's a labeling uh, product they publish them there the customers of our customer which I will call them the end users can contact us to receive a paper copy of the IFU uploaded to the website of our customer. Sometimes it happens that the end user contact us directly uh, for the product info. And the question is, I wonder if it is needed to ask approval of the end user to forward his email to our customer. Okay, yeah. I understood the question. Did you get it, Eve? Um, it's a long question. So, so there is there is this uh, website um, from the customers of of On, and then uh, in which the, uh, this this IFU um, information is being posted, but this this information is from their customers, not from them. If there is a request from uh, a, a, any user through the website. That is, that is received by the, the, the provider of this solution, can they just forward this email to their customer? Or would that be a, a privacy problem? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, it will all depend what's been agreed upon, I think. Um, as far as I understand the question, um, so the question is, do you need to ask permission to the user yes. itself before forwarding his email to the right company? 
Oh, that's 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 really uh, indeed uh, a contractual question. Uh, it's it's difficult to answer, I think, uh, with the information that I have now. Um, I would think that you need consent uh, in general so that uh, you make clear to users of the system that uh, that information can be transmitted or not and that you have yeah. consent in that area. Yeah, so customer. that's also but maybe my, my... maybe this is something to be taken offline because it's 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 really a very specific question mm -hmm. uh, about legislation. Uh, and I can only provide my personal opinion on that, and uh, it's yeah. it's legislation. So, yeah, what I think we could say, well, if I'm I'm thinking what how we are doing this because you can you you can also think about this uh, in a in a in a different setting, right? I have a website on that form. I have a web. Uh, I have a oh, sorry on that web page. I have a form where people can ask a question. I receive that question as a company. But this question is something that Eve from QBD can answer. Uh, but so the question is, can I just forward it to you and you answer that person? Then that person could say to me, hey, why did you forward it to Eve? I did not ask it to Eve, I asked it to you. So now Eve and QBD has my information. I didn't want that. So um, the, the way I would solve it is on your web page where you put that form, add a checkbox in which you explain that uh, by using the form, you are giving consent to SciLife that our partners, QBD, uh, are allowed to uh, see your data or uh, you, you, and you can define exactly up to what extent uh, that data that is entered in the form will be used. So you, you can explain that if the user checks the checkbox and is okay with that, great, then I can forward it to Eve and Eve can directly answer the question if not don't use the form if you don't want that right so you're uh, you're you're warning the person up front if you want me to provide you with the right answer and i need to consult or i need to forward it um yeah you will have to agree to these terms otherwise i cannot help you that's that that might be might be useful uh annika i uh, i hope that um, um answers your question if not, feel free to uh, to um, yeah post a follow up question. Uh, Damiano says thank you very much for the clear answers. Uh, you are very welcome, uh, Damiano. And Annika already confirms that this answered her question. Thank you, Annika. Okay, let's go to the next question. So let me see. We have a question that says, we hear a lot about computer software assurance. Uh, so yeah, CSA. So what is it and what's the status? Yeah, I, I know it's a it's a topic that you particularly like as a CSV expert, right, Eve? So I know that QBD has posted some, some blog posts around this, this topic. So yeah, um, yeah, the question is, what is it exactly and what's the status around this computer software assurance? I thought it was computer system assurance, but I might make a mistake. Yeah. Yes, what's what's in the name, of course. To yeah. answer that question, I would shortly like to go back to the beginnings of computerized system validation. Um, when did CSV? Uh, it won't be CSV? a history lesson, will it, Dave? No, 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 no. <laughs> it won't be history, but you need to have that information to All right, okay, the cool. completely. So uh, CSV really uh, came to existence in, I think, late 80s, 90s, uh, but it became really uh, something uh, of uh, actual value at the time when 21 CFR Part 11 was published, which was, if I'm not mistaken, in August uh, 1997. Because if computerized systems were used as of that date by life science companies uh, in the United States, they need to validate their system. So CSV became mand uh, mandatory at the time. Um, now in the beginning, it was all quite unclear and companies, they interpreted it like how oh, we have to test everything. We will never stop putting uh, documentation together. And at mm -hmm. the time, uh, companies were creating uh, closets full of binders on paper eh, because you, you could not put it electronically because you couldn't sign it electronically uh, and and 
I've been in companies where there were like uh, entire warehouses full of validation binders. Um, during those years, uh, there was already a tendency to uh, move into a direction which I like particularly, which is pragmatism. You have to be pragmatic. Otherwise, you will focus your effort on writing documents just to put a binder the sake together. of writing documents. Yes, yeah. Precisely. Absolutely. Um, and this is something the industry uh, hates eh, because it costs a lot of money and it has less value. A few years ago, uh, it came from within uh, the Food and Drug Administration, pushed by the industry, was a tendency to move towards uh, computer software assurance which is going uh, about it very, very much more pragmatically. Um, in the past, you had to write down every line of test that you were going to do. Uh, now they say, no, you don't have to do that anymore. Look at it risk-based and do exploratory testing, do unscripted testing for those areas that are maybe not required to do it all uh, documented into detail. Um, but there is an unfortunate side effect of that. The guidance is still not official. They have not published it. So the FDA have not, has not published, published it. The last rumors were that it was going to be published this year. So they still have two months to do that. Uh, but they see the same for last year. Of course, we had that uh, little issue around the world that slowed down many things. Um, and there is another rumor that says that they want to update 21 CFR Part 11 first. Now, they have been saying that they were going to update Part 11, I think, since 2004. And it's been on the table. It's been ready to be republished as a new version. And it never happened for several yep. reasons. So, uh, but I am anxiously waiting to see the guidance on paper uh, being published by the FDA. Okay, but we will have to wait for the exact date. We, we don't know that. Exactly. Yet, right? We can use mm -hmm. pragmatism already. I've been doing that for the last 20 years. Uh, but of course, you still need to, uh, well, put the balance still right between documentation mm. and pragmatic approaches. So then uh, what I'm thinking about this is that um, as, you're, as you're explaining this, CSA will not really replace csv will it no it will not okay. replace it it will uh, reshape it and mm -hmm. it will give us more tools uh, one of the things maybe just a little example is in the past if you use the tool to do testing uh, there were some people around they say yeah you have to validate it like it was a system that you use for example your production in 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 a life science company it's mm -hmm. insane uh, if you can just demonstrate that the tool does what it does, focus on your end application instead of the tool. Um, so that's one of the concrete examples where CSA will help us in the future. Also, if we think of artificial intelligence, uh, if you have to write down every line of test, if you have to document every step of your approach, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a burden and it will slow down innovation. Innovation is going so fast that we cannot follow it if we have to st st stick to the old way of CSV waterfall model. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. We've all also been investigating if we could maybe switch to uh, a, a more pragmatic CSA approach uh, last year to validate our own uh, solution. But there is another another issue that we identified. Um, you can you can do that uh depending on the regulation itself but also on market acceptance right if you're trying to sell a solution uh to um, different parts of the world where uh, even if the csa the guidance is there and, and people start using it and it's accepted by some um markets or sectors or regions you still have to ask yourself uh if, if enough people will accept it. If we would switch to a CSA approach for our validation documentation, it might not, we came to the conclusion that, that the market would not uh, be ready for it in the next few years. 
So uh, what you don't want to do is to have a CSA approach and a CSV approach for the people that want the old fashioned way of uh, documenting. So in, in that case, I think CSA will be very, very helpful for people that need to do CSV internally to validate their systems to get audited and to uh, comply with regulation. And then they can convince one person, one auditor, this is why we did it with CSA, not with CSV. However, if you're developing a, a medical device, which is a, a, a software, uh, and you're trying to sell it worldwide, you probably are stuck with CSV for a long time. Uh, do you agree with it? Yes, well, um, first of all, CSV and CSA are not that different. It's mm -hmm. just the level of documentation uh, employing more risk-based approach. We will still have a validation plan and a report in CSA. It will still be mm -hmm. there. So the difference is, is the differences are not that huge, but it will help us uh, reduce the burden of documenting just to create documents. Yeah. It will give us rationales to work more efficiently. Uh, but indeed, uh, until it is official, uh, and even then, just a word about that. Let's say that uh, in December, as a Christmas present, the FDA will give us the CSA guidance. Uh, it will quite, take quite some time to uh, change the minds of auditors, of inspectors, and of QA managers within companies to uh, ride on the wave of CSA. Uh, so mm -hmm. they will also need to be convinced there will be a lot of uh, sticking to the old idea just for comfort's sake. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, you, you mentioned it already a little bit. You, you mentioned AI and machine learning, right, in your answer. So um, what about validating those types of solutions? Because we, we know that we already had quite some uh, yeah, question marks put against us validating a SaaS application, which was used by uh, tons of different customers, right? Um, we, but but it, it is essentially one application layer used by everybody at the same time. And then databases are completely separate, but still it's it's one application. How can, how uh, people came from the, from the on-premise mindset where you install something for yourself, the other customer installs something for himself uh, and then would validate it or, or you can help them validate still, but then validating a, a SaaS was was already yeah um, strange for people. Now now we go a step further. What about AI and and really uh, solutions that have kind of a black box uh, of what's happening behind the scene within that software uh, and the output that it's giving, which is not uh, the the code from a software developer where you can go through and understand it. And, and validate the output according to that, right? It's it's a it's a, yeah. Um, this 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 uh, uh, the the fact that you have that you miss this transparency, I think, is a, a huge challenge to to validate something. So, how are you guys at QBD um, validating these types of applications? As you mentioned, artificial intelligence. If you put it next to traditional computerized system validation, it is a huge challenge. Yeah. Um, I would say if, if you have an uh, artificial intelligence application, the first thing that you need to do uh, is what is the intended use and what is the impact on uh, product quality, patient safety, data integrity, the traditional things you have to look at when you do a risk assessment. Um, and the higher the risk, uh, the more you need to think about what could possibly happen if I just let my application do the thinking and do the thinking for me. Um, mm -hmm. If the risks are not high, you can have an approach where you, let's say, provide a lot of autonomy to the application. If the risks get higher, you will need to build in certain uh, evaluation moments. So let's say that AI has done its work uh, in, in a test environment for about a month then you will need to do some validation cycle to use it in production. Uh, that's an approach that you could use. Now, the guidance, uh, the official guidance around uh, using artificial intelligence is also 
quite emerging at the time. So the uh, uh, governmental bodies are also thinking about it. How can we use it? Because as mentioned before, this is part of uh, our ever evolving world, which goes quicker and quicker and has mm -hmm. big added value. So we need to be sure that we can use this. Um, Definitely, but, yeah. Yes. Okay, I didn't know you were you were finished already. <laughs> okay, so no, that uh, that makes sense. So the challenge is there, but it, it's not impossible. That's for sure, right? I mean, no, no. it's it's definitely doable. Just thinking about it, there is one more thing, and it's also something uh, which could be a question. Uh, often with artificial intelligence, but also with other software, we have seen a shift from uh, a paradigm shift from the traditional way of developing. Mm -hmm. to uh, the new ways of developing um, and then i'm thinking about uh, the term is just slipping my head uh, lean lean uh, lean development uh, all those methodologies and they do not really fit one-on-one -on -one with the traditional csv uh, now if oh, okay you, you're you're yeah. you're thinking about agile i'm thinking about agile yes the term slipped my mind for a second uh, so this is something that you can use in validation, and there are also strategies how to implement making use of uh, agile development. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, uh, I see a, an interesting question around data integrity. Um, so the question is, is, is quite broad, but, but let's see how far uh, you can answer this. So how to implement data integrity at the organization level? So what, what do you need to think about? How, how, where do you start, right? Yes. Uh, first of all, for many of the topics that we have been discussed, I often point people to the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineering, the ESPE, mm -hmm. as they have a vast uh, uh, set of uh, guidance documents that can help you in the different domains. Uh, we have no professional relationship with them. Guidances are not cheap, but they are really, really uh, the, the, the information to go to if you want more information. And this is especially also the case for data integrity. Now, suppose you're a company, uh, you take the step to say, hey, I want to be uh, fully aligned with the principles of data integrity. Uh, first of all, you need to uh, lift that to the highest level of your company. Uh, if you do CSV, you will have certain applications that are that have to be regulated. If you talk about data integrity, it is company wide. It's it's really a mindset that has to live in the head of every person working for that the company. company. Mm -hmm. Yes. If if I go into the office tomorrow uh, and and if you would project it towards CSV. I remember many times that people say, hey, uh, I've done the test last week. Uh, can you please sign it uh, on the date of last week, Friday? <laughs> yes, that's something very trivial and you can quickly do it, but it's a huge data integrity uh, infringement. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's backdating and you cannot do that. Um, so it really has to be in the mind. The program has to be sponsored by highest management within the company. And then, of course, you need to create a strategy, uh, look at the different tools, which applications do I use, what are the processes, uh, and, and it's an entire program that you will need to uh, initiate. And it's not something that you will say, hey, I'll start next week and, and, and in the beginning of next year, it will be ready. It's quite, uh, it's quite an effort, of course, depending on the company size and the reasons why you will want to implement data integrity. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Uh, it's it's a, definitely a, 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 an important and, and big project that needs to be supported by all levels of the organization. That's, that's what you're saying um and not not a, a small task that's for sure uh, a question from dimitri um i wonder whether most companies are using specific software for their csv or are still using a traditional manual process to create their documentation obviously the first would still bring the need uh, to validate that software in the first place so any insights uh, or own practices, Eve? 
yeah. can also answer something about that. <laughs> I can. Uh, uh, but I assume you, you go can. first. Yes. Uh, yeah. You see, when you come uh, visit customers, you see several ways of approaching this, and often with typical problems. Uh, I see people who, uh, or companies rather, that are uh, creating the documents, they print them, they sign them, they scan them, and then they save them just on a, a shared folder or on a team site. It's not ideal. Um, sometimes they use tools that are better, but indeed they are not validated by themselves. Um, now you can ask yourself, we talked about CSA, maybe uh, in the future, it's allowed to uh, prove that the application that you use to store the, that documentation just needs to be demonstrated that it's fit for intended use. Although, uh, ideally, it would be part of your uh, quality management, document management system, where you can uh, keep your documents within that protected environment and having the functionality, for example, to uh, create electronic signatures. Mm -hmm. So um, I would only advise to use a tool that is really uh, intended to uh, store validation documents. So, so uh, at QBD, what what are you guys using mostly? I think it's it's Word, Excel, just the traditional uh, ways of, of of just creating documents, yes. items in Excel. Yes. Copy yes. them, put put them in in Word documents where needed. Traceability matrix is a, is again an Excel sheet. Yes. So yeah, um, what I can say about that because we need to. Well, I mean, we have twelve modules in Scilife, right? As I explained, we validate each module separately. Uh, we do one to three new releases per module per year, and we're always developing new modules to add to the uh, to the software suite, to the solution suite of Scilife. So that means that if you take an average of two uh, releases per year per module, if you have 12 modules, that's 24, 24 releases. And then uh, maybe you do uh, a few new modules during that year, maybe four. So that's already 26, uh, sorry, 28 uh, releases per year, uh, which is a huge effort on our QA, QC team to develop and update all that validation documentation, do the testing, et cetera. What we've done, uh, we use our own document control module just to store the document and sign off electronically. So that already helps. However, what we've done uh, to uh, uh, link items and things like that, we actually use uh, um, uh, the, the Google um, Sheets in order to work with um, yeah, smart formulas to link things together and uh, especially uh, generate the traceability matrix automatically. So it, it is a rudimentary approach, but it's very, very effective and it definitely um, reduces time. What we have on the planning though is uh, on the roadmap, we have a validation module in mind, uh, which we wanted to develop for ourselves. The development has already started in which you can uh, go through the whole CSV process within that module. So you're not creating Word documents and Excels anymore. What you're going to do is to uh, define your validation project in that module. You're going to define your validation plan, validation report. And what we saw, what we found was that uh, if you look at what CSV documents are, we reduce it to three types of documents. Uh, we, the ones that we call static documents, documents like a validation plan or a validation summary report where you just enter text. That's just a static document. You need them. You need to just draft it, uh, have your chapters there. That's it. Um, then there are uh, documents that we call linked items. So you have a document with static text, uh, your URS, right? Where, where you explain how uh, something about the system. And then you're going to create URS items those URS items need to be linked to your FS items, to your DS items, to your UATs, all that. So these are called linked items. These are not created in a Word document anymore, but within the validation module. So there is a form. You can just keep adding items. These items are identified by our unique identifier automatically within the system. And then when you create your FS, you can link to your URS. Or when you create your UAT, you can link to your FS and your URS this creates automatically or generates your uh, traceability matrix. The third type of uh, document are uh, checklists. 
Sometimes uh, you need not only to link items, but you also need to execute those items. So these are your UATs, your PQTs, your IQTs, your, your OQTs, et cetera, right? your test scripts for, for PQ, IQ, OQ. And in the, and there, what you need to do is to execute them and lock uh, proof of your action, mark it as, uh, as a, um, um, uh, yeah, failed or, or success, right? So you go through it. If, if there is a fill, you need to do a rerun. So all those runs are then maintained within the same validation uh, module with one, one, once you have finished all that with one click on a button, it generates all your PDFs with your linked items, referring the IDs as if you would have typed it. Uh, uh, but you're essentially working in a web-based system, which is much more user-friendly, much less risky, uh, and um, yeah, uh, and much more efficient. So that's what we have in um, uh, in mind for this validation module to help ourselves, but also to help the yeah the the life sciences sector to go through CSV projects and stop doing that in Word and Excel, which is time-consuming, error-prone, uh, uh, and yeah, very inefficient. So yeah, we have to be careful with the uh, time. We have four minutes left. I want to be respectful and, and yeah, just stick to the one-hour webinar. I think we have uh, time for one more small question. Uh, maybe a Q, I see here a, a QA-specific question. Uh, yeah, this one is fun. Uh, are planned deviations acceptable? So a deviation, I log it in uh, SciLife or whatever you use, uh, and I and I create a planned deviation. If as a QA expert, what do you think about that? Uh, we don't like the term a planned deviation, but <laughs> there might be some situations where this is the only solution. Um, once again, things that are quite common and and should be in the back of the minds of everyone is go about this risk based and document it. Uh, write a very clear rationale why you are doing a planned deviation and, and it might be the best worst solution that there is at that time and in that case if, if you do the risk assessment if you document it clearly if all stakeholders agree with the way of working I don't see why why not so um, but it's to be avoided of course yes Okay, I hope that answers the question, uh, Hugo, or Hugo, I don't know who that is. Okay, so um, maybe one last question uh, that I have in mind, Eve, is about um, data-driven decision-making in, in quality systems. Uh, I, th I know that people find it more and more important, uh, but, but have you also noticed this trend that people really want to measure everything in their quality system and get... Uh, more insights, right? So is, is there is that changing in the market? What, what is your view on that? Yes, it's, it does. Uh, Data-driven is, is the way forward. Eh? Uh, mm. QBD is uh, rather successful at the time. And I think one of the reasons we are is that we have a CEO who is very data-driven. Data but besides that, if you're in a quality environment, uh, you will have many uh, KPIs. And the way to uh, calculate uh, the KPIs is by getting those data. For example, uh, how long are uh, CAPAs open? How long are they overdue? Uh, only by doing that, you can find the, the, uh, the root causes behind it and it will help you. So mm -hmm. if you have a system that provides you with a lot of data, uh, not just primary data, but also uh, more intelligent data from within the system, it will help you a lot. And it's something that we see and that we are asked for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We also noticed more and more customers want to basically uh, link their Power BI solution to directly to our database. Uh, we offer uh, ways to do that. And we, it also triggered us to uh, revamp completely our KPI module. We had a KPI module in the past that was uh, okay, but a bit limiting, uh, and we 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 don't we didn't use it with Power BI technology. Instead, we use the QuickSight technology, which is native from uh, from Amazon AWS, in order to uh, generate graphs uh, and provide the insights in the SciLife data within this KPI module. So yeah, we we also needed to 
to uh, give our customers more insights uh, into their QMS data. So yeah, it's definitely uh, an important trend to, to follow and make sure that you are looking at the right KPIs, getting the data in real time uh, and help you with the decision making. So, okay, um, I think we should wrap up. Eve, I would like to thank you very much for being here. It was a, a very nice hour of uh, interesting insights into, into these different topics. So again, thank you for, for that, really appreciate it. Thank you for the platform, Philippe. You're welcome. And, uh, and thank all the attendees for being here and for your nice, uh, very, very interesting questions, uh, which helped us make this whole thing interactive and, and really answer questions that you have on your minds. Um, uh, questions that I still see here that are unanswered will be answered by email. So don't worry about that. Um, with that, thank you very much. Have a great day. And hopefully we will see each other in the future. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye.